Your electricity supply starts with 200 power stations run by the Central Electricity Generating Board and the two Scottish boards. They are responsible for high voltage transmission through the lines of the national supergrid. Electricity distribution boards, covering every area of the country, provide the power links to your homes and workplaces. It's this second stage of distribution that we're going to look at. More than 20 million customers are served and everyone must be provided with a continuous, reliable supply of electricity at the lowest possible price. This means a vast investment in men and equipment to carry out the engineering tasks involved and it's their approach that we're going to examine. How do the electricity boards arrange a continuous, reliable supply at the lowest possible price? Now the boards take their power from bulk supply points on the national grid. Because it's cheaper to transmit electricity at high voltages, distribution to customers begins at 132,000 volts. A line like this can carry sufficient power for a whole town or a large industrial complex. As the network spreads out, the voltage is reduced in successive stages by transformers until the 240 volts home supply is reached. The design, installation and maintenance of distribution systems demand engineering skills and expertise over this sort of wide range. I'm still not happy about this. I don't see why we shouldn't double main this in view of the high ADMD. Hmm. Well, in my experience, I don't think so. Well, why don't we just run it through the computer? Suppose the wire breaks before the bomb reaches the ground. The lightning flash is not going to be guided anymore. It might bring the whole balloon down in flames. Well, yes, but this is exactly why we've taken this into account by carrying the coil in the drop weight. By carrying the whole of the wire in the bomb to ground, there should never ever be a force strong enough to break the wire. Could you investigate, please? Reporting centre, Chester. Distribution engineering goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mervyn, I see. You're sending an engineer out. A fundamental duty of the engineer is to give customers a reliable service. Because failure of the supply will cause anything from minor inconvenience to severe economic disruption. In fact, British power supply is extremely reliable, averaging a remarkable 99.98%, or around one hour lost per customer per year. But where reliability is concerned, you get what you pay for. Low reliability is cheap, complete reliability is very expensive indeed. So the design engineer must strike a balance. A basic network would be cheap and nasty for customers suffering long blackouts. On the other hand, too complex a system will be too expensive. In other words, 100% reliability is unattainable. Faults are always bound to happen. So the engineers look to the causes of faults and find ways of keeping them to a minimum. The electricity boards work together in collecting information about all types of faults and interruptions which affect their customers. 
At a central London office, reports are filed daily and the information is catalogued. It's then fed into the computer. As a result, the rates at which different types of faults occur can be compared and patterns or exceptions detected. Faults are also classified into major groups, of which three are of great importance. The first are those brought about by wear and tear, such as burnt contacts. The boards minimize these faults by carrying out regular inspections and preventive maintenance. One of the most important maintenance techniques is live line working. It's particularly important in rural areas where single supply lines can't otherwise be checked or repaired without blacking out all the customers. And on a farm, for instance, this might mean interrupting the milking or stopping agricultural machines. But if the work can be carried out with the line alive, there's no inconvenience to the customer. Special tools are used, which insulate the linesman from the power. This line is alive, carrying 11,000 volts. So the teams are highly trained and protected by standard codes of practice and stringent safety rules. The result is a more efficient system, with maintenance work carried out immediately that would otherwise have had to wait. And it's meant a halving of the number of times the power has to be cut off each year. A second major group of faults are those caused accidentally, such as pickaxes into cables. Here, laboratory research is being carried out to reveal design weaknesses in equipment. The third major group of faults are those brought about by the weather, atmospheric pollution, and most serious of all, Information collected by the engineers shows that many more interruptions are caused by lightning than can be simply explained by the number of direct strikes to power lines. We've decided to carry out our initiation experiment in the region of Trosvinneth. Now, I can refer you to the main map. The one Important experiments into the effects of lightning strikes up to half a mile away from power lines are being carried out by supply industry research engineers. And we've therefore decided one experiment is an attempt to trigger lightning by firing a rocket from a captive balloon. The results will help verify a major theory of the effects of lightning on distribution systems and help cut down the number of blackouts during storms. The theory is that a lightning flash starts with a leader stroke which forms a conducting path as it goes by ionizing the air. Upon reaching the ground, the main discharge takes place as the return stroke current rises from the ground to the cloud. As the stroke rises, an electromagnetic field is radiated and moves progressively outwards, the edge of the field setting up a high voltage on the line where the field moves across it. This voltage increases until a flashover occurs, first draining the charge which is built up on the line and then leaving a path to earth for a fault current. The fault current flows until a circuit breaker opens. The breakers are set to reclose automatically and restore the supply once the fault is cleared. This theory is of great importance to the electricity supply industry. From it are calculated mathematical models which have made a profound impact on the operation of circuit breakers and insulators which protect power lines from the effect of lightning. As a result, there's been a considerable improvement in reliability at very little cost to the customer. Also for the customer, there's another and equally important area of cost, and that's in the labor, equipment and materials needed to work the system. It's a problem to which the electricity boards devote a great deal of attention.
here is a typical control center. The forward planning of resources, both men and machines, is handled in a way that's both logical and disciplined. No one is sent on a job unless it's properly organized. Mechanical aids are available when and where they're needed. And if, for example, you compare the costs of mechanical equipment against the cost of labor these days, you don't have to save much time to justify the use of mechanical equipment. And the resulting increase in productivity clearly helps to keep costs down. There are machines like the magic mole, which digs itself under roads or through embankments, leaving a cable path behind it. There's help for the more conventional approach to cable laying. Or there's the line pal, which puts pole handling or line stringing almost into the do-it-yourself category. The cost of components is another major item. But with advanced technology, savings are being made. For example, combined transformers and switchgear would save both space and cabling. One of the most important developments in recent years has been the development of new types of low voltage cables. These are known as CNE, or Combined Neutral and Earth Cables, and they have aluminium conductors. The cables they replace had separate neutral and earth conductors, generally made of copper and lead, so they were much more expensive. A major advantage of CNE cables is in the jointing process, which is simpler, faster, and cheaper. For an industry that lays several thousand kilometers of cable a year, the actual length of cable runs assumes considerable importance. In new housing estates, for example, much care is taken to keep cables as short and as small as possible. The systems designer is faced with an estate layout. He knows where the power loads are greatest, possible sites for substations, and possible cable routes, which generally correspond to road and path layouts. His problem is to select the cheapest combination of substation and cable sites and sizes which will carry the load. The possibilities are almost limitless and even the most powerful computers would take several thousand years to examine them all and find the best solution. The electricity board designer has had to rely on past experience to find an acceptable solution. But he can't be certain that it's the best and cheapest. So supply industry research engineers have developed a computer program to help solve the problem. Oh, blimey. If we do change those around, we'll never get converging. Oh, I think you will if you increase the over-relaxation factor. The aim of the program is not to seek the perfect design, but rather to produce consistently good, low-cost designs in quick time. The program begins its work by looking at the currents in all the possible cable routes. These currents cause losses which are higher in some parts of the circuit. The program relates these losses to the cost of the cables needed to carry the load. So the next step is to delete the areas of highest loss and therefore highest cost. In this way, an efficient and low cost network is evolved. The program then calculates the voltage drops at the end of the network and selects cables of the right sizes to bring the voltage drops within acceptable limits and make certain that no part of the circuit will overheat. Finally, the computer prints out a detailed summary of the design and the overall cost. Well, although this one looks all right on paper, I would settle for this scheme because since we have common trenching for our cables, we can well save on excavation costs. I suggest we have another trial run on this one. Yes, and uh, compare prices.
We've seen something now of the wide range of engineering skills and expertise needed to supply electricity. It's a widespread industry, meeting the challenge of providing reliable service at a reasonable price. We've seen how the electricity boards cooperate in providing information, and how this information is catalogued and used as a database for practical research work. We've seen something of the links between theory and practice, helping to modify and improve the distribution system at moderate cost. We've heard about methods of controlling the cost of labor and equipment, of components and of materials. And finally, we've examined computer technology in the service of better and more economic systems design. At the end of the circuit is the customer. And the aim of all the engineering is to give every customer a continuous, reliable supply of electricity at the lowest possible price.